my prediction is that by you know the end of the year, you'll see a majority of transactions sub ten five thousand dollars uh, globally be on Lightning instead of L1. You know, there there's some kind of minimum trust is I think acceptable for most people. So as in the custody itself is fully trustless. Like the funds that you receive are yours. It's like for the moment of that transaction, you're going to actually trust maybe a, 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 as a fragment of a transaction, a number of different parties. And I think that's potentially okay for most people. If you want a state of the union of Lightning right now, I think you know the, the custodial part of Lightning is now fully solved. It works, it's reliable, transaction success rates are super high, it's cash final settlements, you know, at war speed, it's like amazing, it works. Non-custodial lightning is super challenging. And there's still a lot of work that needs to be done, something that we're working on and we're committed in working on, not because this is part of our business, but because we think it's absolutely vital and essential for the health of the network to have self-custody work really well. This podcast is entertainment, not financial tax or legal advice. Views expressed represent statements of the speaker in their individual capacity, do not represent the views of Unchained, and should not be considered investment advice. Speakers often have personal family or business connections to Unchained, which may include direct financial benefits. Please see our disclosure at unchained.com slash podcast. Awesome. David, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Of course. You've had so much success as a founder over you know many years. Why do you think you've had this much success? Well, I think... The first thing is I'm uh, kind of very uh, determined and obsessive about the things I go after and uh, very stubborn, I guess. So, uh, you know, that might have helped. Fair. Yeah. Um, can you kind of give the audience like a little bit of background, like your early days of starting your first company, like what it was and why you decided to start it? Sure. So my first company was actually a telco slash ISP back in Switzerland at the time uh, where the market was opening up to competition and new entrants. And I felt uh, really, really angry uh, that there was uh, just one incumbent that was uh, price gouging uh, everyone. And uh, it felt like a good opportunity. I knew nothing about telcos or ISPs, but I was 23 and uh, figured it out. Uh, so sold that company, started another company that was kind of the precursor of what uh, ended up becoming Zong, the mobile payments company that PayPal acquired. Uh, and then went on to PayPal and then from there to Facebook and now to being an entrepreneur again and starting a new company again with Lightspark. Yeah, that's crazy to think about. I guess, what was the moment in your career when you you know, were at Facebook and then you decided to leave Facebook and start like Lightspark? Like what was the, what made you jump and do that? Well, Libra was basically dead in the water at that point. Mm -hmm. And so it was very obvious to me that I needed to go figure out another way of doing this uh, using a different kind of approach, which is what we're doing here. Uh, and so in December of 21, uh, Libra was kind of completely blocked from all regulatory avenues by the summer of 21. Uh, I felt like I needed to wrap things up and make sure that there was good uh, succession for all the payments business and the rest of the activity that was going on. And, you know, by December of 21, that was the case. So I left, took four months off and then started uh, Lightspark. When you were building out Libra, like, did you think it would be successful initially? And like, what were kind of the initial goals when you, you started that at, at Facebook? So, yeah, I mean, typically you want to start something by believing it's going to be successful, but we knew it was going to be really hard. Mm -hmm. uh, we knew it was going to be a, a tough hill to climb, but the opportunity of really changing and reinventing the way money moved between billions of people around the world on an open network was so incredibly energizing that it was worth a swing. And so we took that swing and we tried with everything we had to convince the world that it was worth uh, existence, mm -hmm. uh, worth to exist basically. And, um, and, you know, we failed at that mission. And, uh, and you know, there it was a combination of different things uh, lots of learnings. I certainly don't regret doing it because it, it was really the most intellectually stimulating years of my life. Uh, and I think we learned a lot. Like we learned that if you want to truly build something revolutionary in the way that money moves around the world and build it on top of an open interoperable network, 
uh, then it has to be built on top of something that's maximally neutral and maximally decentralized. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where we're building on Bitcoin now. But, uh, but the first version uh, and first attempt of that was actually trying to build a stable coin on top of a proprietary blockchain. Uh, and stable coins are great and solve a lot of problems, but they have one major issue, which is that you have to have a centralized issuer uh, basically issue the stable coins and manage the underlying reserve. And so that in itself is like too much centralization if your entire payment network actually depends on it. And so that's why we're architecting the things the way that we are and building on top of Bitcoin this time around. Nice. Yeah, I like it. What was your opinion on Bitcoin like initially, like when you started building that, like, did you think Bitcoin had a role and like, did you recognize that there's an importance in this open permissionless money or were you like, you kind of discounted that at first or? No, no. So I was, I've been deep, deep in Bitcoin since 2012. Okay. Um, and when we started the Libra project, the first thing I did was actually go and visit Elizabeth Stark, who was working from a small office in San Francisco and try to explore whether Lightning was going to be the way we were going to build this. And, um, and conceptually, uh, that's what I wanted to do because I wanted this whole thing to be maximally decentralized. Uh, unfortunately, Lightning was really not ready for prime time. And certainly, we, th we don't think it was ready for prime time when we started working on it two years ago. Uh, and now we feel it's really turning a corner and uh, getting mainstream adoption, You've seen the news of us enabling Lightning for Coinbase mm -hmm. a few weeks ago, uh, which is now rolled out to 100% of the customers. Um, but at the time, we really wanted to do it in the most decentralized possible way. And so we started our, our, our whole investigation of how we're going to approach this problem of making money move seamlessly 24-7 in an interoperable, interoperable open way by looking at Bitcoin and Lightning, but just wasn't ready. Yeah, makes sense. Looking back to your telecom days, like, could you even have imagined like building on Bitcoin or even like the concept of Bitcoin and building like a payments company that's like digitally native? Or was that just like so far out there? At the time? Well, I mean, I'm going to age myself, but when I was, you know, building these telco companies, Bitcoin didn't even exist. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, no, I didn't imagine doing this at the time. Uh, but, you know, during my time at PayPal, uh, when I got really deep in Bitcoin, um, I, I kind of, I, I, at some point, uh, I think it was 2013, uh, when I was starting to think about doing something else, uh, I almost left to build a, a, a new exchange uh, in the US uh, for Bitcoin. Uh, and probably I, I might, you know, I might have been successful in, in doing that at the yeah. time. It was 2013. It was really early. Um, but then didn't end up doing it uh, because trading wasn't really my thing. You know, I'm yeah. kind of a payments guy at heart. And so uh, I, I like to solve like mass market problems for people when it comes to money movement. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I decided to to focus my attention. But uh, but yeah, so Bitcoin has been on my mind for a very long time now. What was like, do you remember your original touch point with Bitcoin? Was yeah. it, an, uh, what was it? So the, the first time I came across it was in 2010. Okay. Um, and I remember reading about it. I remember trying to understand it. Uh, and then, you know, just discounting it at the time. I was like, okay, this is like, even by my own deeply geeky standards, it's like too geeky. <laughs> uh, and so I kind of pushed it aside. Uh, and then uh, in 2012, um, a good friend of mine who's very well known in Bitcoin circles, uh, Wences Cazares, uh, we were hanging out all the time and he really insisted like, oh no, you don't understand. This is going to change the world. You need to spend time on it. You need to understand how it works. You need to play with it. You need to read about it. Uh, and then I started going down the rabbit hole and never came out. And, um, and so uh, he deserves all the credit of, you know, really intronizing me officially into this uh, obsession uh, about Bitcoin for now over 12 years. Very cool. So it was for you, it was like a person that you trusted that really encouraged you to dive deep. Was there like any sort of like idea or narrative that really clicked for you at the time? Or was it more just like 
this person was enough to make you actually do some more research and, and learn a little no, bit? No, my, my first transaction was the moment where the light bulb went off. Like the ability to do a transaction between two non custodial wallets with no intermediary whatsoever, uh, like digital payments, like with no middleman, mm -hmm. uh, really blew my mind. Uh, and then, uh, and then in 2013, uh, when I was running PayPal, uh, there was this moment where Argentina asked us to impose currency control uh, with uh, Argentinian, uh, basically preventing them from moving their funds out of the country. And that day, when we applied those restrictions, uh, we saw the price of Bitcoin really rise. Mm -hmm. And that was another aha moment because I realized, okay, like okay, the, the, the underlying reality of what was going on was actually people running to local markets like physical markets hmm. with ways of cash, uh, with ways of cash, and actually converting that to uh, to Bitcoin uh, to have the freedom that they deserve with the money that they earned uh, legally. So that's a that should be kind of a basic uh, basic human right to have freedom of the money you earned legally. Uh, and so that was another moment where I'm like, this is actually working. It's solving a real world problem for many people. And it's just that we in the U.S. don't realize that yet because we don't have those problems mm -hmm. uh, yet. And so, uh, and so that was kind of the the moment that really made it all come together. Do you expect those problems to eventually potentially come to the U.S. where there's more capital controls and your freedoms are restricted when it comes to money? No, I don't think we'll have that kind of problem. But I think what we are seeing is, you know, with with what we've learned uh, recently, I think you know the, the majority of Americans really didn't understand fractional reserve banking until very recently, and now they had a, 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 a fast accelerated course on what it means to actually you know be in a fractional reserve banking system. So I think the ability for you to have control over your assets, uh, to have a portion of your assets that's actually not controlled by other humans. Yep. Uh, and to have all of these freedoms uh, are essential and uh, and I think super relevant even in the U.S. And that's why, you know, beyond the, specul the speculative nature of Bitcoin, you see more and more adoption because it's such a good hedge to inflation, it's such a good hedge to monetary policy, um, and it's an escape valve uh, from the system. And I think it's a, it's a very good escape valve. Uh, and we had escape valves like with gold, and silver and other precious metals over the years. And I think this is such a much better version of that. Yep. Has so, so, you know, from getting into Bitcoin so long ago, has adoption happened like faster or slower than, than you thought would happen? No, I think with Bitcoin, you'd be hard pressed to find anyone who says things are happening faster than I thought. Yeah. <laughs> I think <laughs> that's the one network uh, that is moving at, you know, glacial pace, uh, but for a reason. I think mm -hmm. the, the, the focus of the core development group on keeping the code base stable, on making sure that the expectations that everyone has over the evolution of the protocol are clearly set and met, um, I think is very important for trust. And, uh, and so it's moving very slowly uh, but it's kind of this freight train that can't be stopped. It's um, it crossed so many different milestones and so many different gates uh, that uh, and 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 walls that were erected in its path, and um, and you know one after the other it clears them and gets to the next level, which is really fascinating to watch. And I think the slow nature of its evolution is what makes its strength as well. Yeah. How do you think about the like price cycles in in Bitcoin as Bitcoin's adoption, like we have these, you know, 2013, 2017, 2021, like they're crazy bull markets uh -huh. and they're crazy bear markets. Do you think that that like slows adoption? Do you think it speeds up adoption? How do you think about that? You know, as a builder on the network, um, I like both cycles as much for different reasons. When you're in a bear market, everyone's focused on the things that matter, uh, solving real problems, on creating more utility in this case, building really consumer-friendly, fast, cheap payments for people on top of Bitcoin and Lightning. Uh, and, uh, and you can build in isolation. No one really cares. Like, there's no spotlight because people have moved on to the next hot thing. Uh, and then in a, in a bull market, everyone cares and everyone gets excited. And so you, know, you have a lot of institutional money coming in. You have more investment. You have all kinds of different things, which are also 
positive, but it creates a, a lot of distraction. Uh, and in bull markets, you also have a lot of hype. I mean, we're here at consensus and you can walk the hall and there's going to be a lot of hyped up projects that yeah. you can see all around you. Some of them you can't even understand. <laughs> uh, but, um, and so that's kind of the downside, but you know, the plus side is everyone wants to be on the network right now. I think, you know, uh, you, you see it with more institutional players coming in and larger players, uh, the need of moving Bitcoin faster, cheaper is now kind of inevitable and something that everyone wants. And so we have the right solution at the right time for the right clients. And we feel very fortunate to be in this position to serve them. Yeah, absolutely. How, how was the process of implementing Lightning at something like Coinbase? Well, so we had the stack ready okay. uh, because we had been working on it for the last two years. Uh, that's also one thing that took much longer than I appreciated when we got started. I thought like, you know, year in, we would have totally tamed the wild beast that uh, Lightning is and it would be working just exactly as it should. Uh, and it turns out it, tar it took us may maybe twice that much time to actually really figure it out. Uh, and, uh, and this whole notion of channel-based payment system is one that is really not super intuitive. This idea that you need to lock up liquidity for payments with uh, another person is easy to wrap your head around, but the minute you start to think about this network as a mesh network of channels and liquidity that needs to be funded in the right place with the right amount of liquidity on the path of the transaction, uh, this idea that you need to rebalance those channels and liquidity every time there's a transaction that uh, went through them, uh, this notion that you need to do multi-part payments and split large payments into smaller payments and reassemble them on the other side of the network while well, each of the different parts took a different route to get there. All of these things are things that not anyone who's not doing this for a living full time is going to want to do or do really well because it's just too much work, um, which is kind of a good mode for us because it's hard mm -hmm. and what we've built has a lot of value. And, uh, and in the case of Coinbase, like others, um, and we have two different types of implementations, but in the case of Coinbase, uh, they're signing every operation on their side. They have their signing server. So they've outsourced everything but the security, uh, like all the complexity of the management of the node, of the channels, of the liquidity, of the rebalancing, of the route finding, all of these things are things that we do. Um, and, uh, and so it, it provides value so they can focus on what matters most, which is offering a really, really great consumer experience, uh, and, uh, and continuing to build on that. So, um, so yeah, it's, I mean, we're, we feel very fortunate to be able to work with them. And, uh, and I think it, it, it's validated a lot of the, the work and assumptions we've made over the, the last two years. Uh, and, and we have many more partners um, of similar size actually onboarding right now that we'll be able to talk about soon. Uh, and uh, it's very exciting, a very exciting time. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, it's great yeah. to hear. Why, like, why did Coinbase just now implement, implement Lightning? Was it because of all those challenges, like they couldn't find a good partner or was there something else in the market that decided that encourage them to finally implement Lightning? So I, I can't speak to Coinbase particularly, but I think, you know, they're not, unique in the sense that we've seen this with many partners and clients around the world that we are powering now, mm -hmm. which is that the, there, there are two aspects. The first one is just the general equation, the pro and con of Lightning. The, the, the problem for many, many exchanges and many institutions that looked at Lightning in the past is everything we just discussed. It's complicated, hard to maintain. You have to have dedicated people look and maintain those nodes and the liquidity and do all of that. And on the other side, it isn't clear especially because the, the, the data of Lightning is so private to understand really the, the volume of transactions actually happening on the network uh, and, uh, and the opportunity. So the opportunity cost uh, equation doesn't compute for many exchanges uh, and many institutions. And so we've, we've made that equation easier to compute because we've reduced the complexity by you know, at least an order of magnitude. Um, and so now it's easy. It's not that costly to do lightning. So might as well do it. Then in turn, like that creates more volume, more participants, and that creates more traction. So it's kind of a flywheel that gets going. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other side of it is the market. And to your point, the market is very different now than it was a few years ago. L1 fees are really high. And while in the U S people might buy Bitcoin by, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of dollars. 
in most parts of the world, people buy $20 or $50 worth of Bitcoin. And if the L1 fee is actually exceeding the amount of Bitcoin that people are buying, they can't move it in or out. And so you can't use it, basically. It makes Bitcoin useless. Mm -hmm. And so Lightning is becoming essential for those types of transactions and smaller transactions. Uh, so it's both solving one part of the equation of making it really worthwhile for large players to uh, like really get onto the network and the fact that the, the fees on L1 are quite high. And then the third part is actually that the use cases, when you have to wait for 10 minutes for a block time to be added to the chain, um, is, uh, is just not enabling you to do any real-time payment use cases. So Lightning makes it real-time. So it's not only a cost uh, and fast movement of withdrawals and deposits of Bitcoin. It's also what are the use cases that you can cover with Lightning that you couldn't cover on L1? Yeah. How do you see like transaction fees on the base layer and on Lightning, I guess, kind of evolving over the next five to 10 years? Like as fees go up on the base layer, do you think that that makes your product obviously a lot and Lightning in general a lot you know, more attractive? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. And And I think, you know, the, the beauty with Lightning is that you, you're you not creating a new trust mechanism. Uh, it's not a side chain. It's not another consensus algorithm. It's not like a centralized layer two. It's like, it's, it's like basically the entire trust uh, that is derived from L1 is actually transposed to Lightning, uh, which is a great, great fact for Lightning. Um, and, and I think that, you know, if you can do and take the best out of L1 in terms of security, trust assumptions, et cetera. Use it for huge transactions. Uh, and then everything else can be on Lightning. Then I think, you know, the market will be much more efficient and everyone has to, you know, will benefit from it. And, and my prediction is that by, you know, the end of the year, you know, give or take six months, um, you'll see a majority of transactions, sub ten five thousand uh, dollars globally, be on Lightning instead of L1. When was the last time your spouse made a Bitcoin transaction with your keys? Unchained Signature is a private client experience designed to not just make you a Bitcoin hero, but to ensure your loved ones are comfortable managing Bitcoin wealth. With quarterly security meetings, personal trust, and IRA accounts included on-call technical support, a discount on trading fees, and more, Signature also includes invites to Unchained exclusive events featuring speakers like Tour de Meester, Peter St. Onge, and Parker Lewis. Sign up for Signature today at unchained.com slash signature to turn your family into Bitcoin legends. And now back to the show. Uh, and that's going to be a big change because the networks are going to be so much more efficient when that happens. Any idea like how many transactions are done now on Lightning versus L1? It's unclear. I think it's still, you know, a, a small yeah. fraction, but growing really rapidly. What we're seeing is the the volume. Of, I mean, of course, the volume on our stack is growing really rapidly. Yeah. But what we're seeing is just the network effects of having all of these pools of liquidity being on the network and how it translates into transaction volume is really something we're seeing firsthand at, at you know, very rapid clip. Nice. Something that I've... I've seen some people talk about is like lightning is occasionally broken or something like some people like developers will like, like, Hey, like maybe this is yeah. working exactly as we, we thought. What's your opinion on that? Like is lightning working? Are we fixing the bugs that come up? Like, how do you think about that? If you use LightSpark, it's not broken at all. Nice. Uh, it's like, thank you for the pitch. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, no, I mean, lightning is hard. Like, yeah. you know, we said it's like yep. really hard when we started, uh, Basically, what we benchmarked is that if you were trying to do a transaction above $50, $75 worth of Bitcoin on Lightning, that you know, over 40% of those transactions would fail. Uh, and now we're processing transactions, single transactions of over $100,000. Uh, and they're actually split in multi-part payments and smaller pieces and then reassembled on the other side, but it works. And so... It, it, the protocol itself, the way that this was designed, was actually very thoughtful. The, the software implementation um, was good on the node side, but what was missing is actually a whole series of software and services on top of the nodes and the distributions that we currently have. Uh, and that was largely in existence. 
And it's almost like, you know, you're asking uh, enterprises to run the core runtime of a certain distribution with no services around it. It's like, it's just not the way that it works, at least for the institutional side uh, of the house. Uh, and both are important, like the self-custody part that has a lot of challenges that I'm sure we're going to get into uh, on Lightning and the large institutional players being on the network, both actually really matter a great deal. Mm. And so it's great that anyone can run a node, but if you want a professional access point to the network that is reliable, enterprise grade, secure with the services that you need, then, you know, that's what we do. Nice. Yeah, it makes sense. So you think a lot of the technical changes or technical improvements are more of like the services around Lightning rather than changes to Lightning itself or like the protocol? Yeah. Yeah. I think the protocol is sound. It's just, you know, you just need to do a lot of work to make it work uh, as a, you know, high quality payment network, which, mm -hmm. you know, it really wasn't. Yep. And honestly, it wasn't really designed for that. And the way that it was built, it was like actually... You know, Alice wants to pay Bob all the time. They're going to open the channel. And then, yes, uh, third-party channels can actually, uh, third-party payments can transit through channels. Uh, but, like, the minute the network gets big, it gets really complicated. And so orchestrating all of that and automating all of that wasn't really part of the thinking of the protocol. It's just, like, the software that needs to be built to automate all of that. So what's your vision of, like, custodial lightning versus non-custodial lightning is it mostly people will outsource you know the the running of the node to someone like lightspark or someone else and then you know that's how people will just use lightning or how do you envision that yeah so i think if, if you want a state of the union of lightning right now i think you know the the custodial part uh of lightning is now fully solved it works it's reliable uh transaction success rates are super high mm -hmm. Uh, it's cash final settlements, you know, at warp speed. It's like amazing. It works. Um, Non-custodial lightning is super challenging. And there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Something that we're working on and we're committed and working on, not because this is part of our business, but because we think it's absolutely vital and essential for the health of the network to have self-custody work really well. Um, and because otherwise we're like any other closed payment network. And just like, that's not what, I think we want for the entire network to be. We want people to be able to actually exit the system, be their self-custodian and have a very high quality lightning experience. Um, and so there, there are a number of challenges. The first one is offline receive, um, which I think is going to be resolved. And, you know, it's going to be resolved by making some acceptable compromises on the trustless nature, the full trustless nature of the transaction. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there are a number of different ways to do that, either through LSPs or other methods, but you know, that will be solved. The other problem is the economics of it. Like you need to actually open a channel for the first time. And if you need to pay an L1 fee for every channel that you open, that creates like a lot of cost for end users, especially because it's a very counterintuitive thing for you to actually pay someone else to send you a first transaction so you can receive other transactions. Like no one, yeah. like it's like, what do you mean? I use Venmo. <laughs> uh, so like, that's not like, you know, the expectation. So we need to make it better. Uh, and then you need to have parked in, inbound liquidity for each of those wallets and those channels, which is like, you know, who's going to do that for no fee. Yeah. So all of these problems can be resolved. And there are a number of really good ideas around, you know, channel virtualization and sharing amongst like, you know, different non-custodial endpoints. Um, all of these introduce some level of minimal trust. Um, and so it's not fully trustless, uh, but at the same time, nothing is really truly fully trustless unless you just, you know, buy your Bitcoin and, you know, you, and I don't know, you buy it from someone else and you put it in a non-custodial wallet, but like there's, there's always some portion of, of trust involved. Uh, and there was always, there's always going to be the option of being fully trustless and have no offline receive and have it costly. But if you want a cheaper version that works really well as consumer expected of non-custodial lightning, then you can have that. Uh, and I think that's probably a year out. Uh, because I think, you know, we're working on a number of things. Other players on the network are working on a number of different ideas. I know Lightning Labs is working on this. I know the LDK team is working on this. Um, so I think a year from now, you'll have good non-custodial Lightning, but it's going to take a village and a lot of work. Yeah, makes sense. So would you say it's 
most likely fully impossible to ever get like fully uh, trustless lightning, like kind of how, you know, you can have a treasure or whatever and send into almost completely trustless. Like, is it, will lightning ever potentially get to that? Like, will we see like some sort of crazy breakthrough one day, maybe? It'll, it'll be possible, but it's yeah. just going to be costly. Yeah. If you want cheap, trust, like as trustless as possible and really great consumer experience, you're going to have some minimal element of trust that mm-hmm. you need to, and and then people will cho- choose what they want, right? Um, but I actually think that you know there there's some kind of minimum trust um, that is I think acceptable for most people. So as in the custody itself is fully trustless, like the funds that you receive are yours. It's like for the moment of that transaction, you're going to actually trust maybe a. a, a as a fragment of a transaction, a number of different parties. Um, and I think that's potentially okay for most people. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. I guess like today, what do you think are the most important use cases for, for lightning in general? So, I mean, right now it's really withdrawal and deposit of Bitcoin faster, cheaper yeah. between exchanges, wallets, and institutions. Uh, and, you know, self-custodial wallets, albeit like, you know, with uh, a subpar experience um and and then you know this is evolving into more mainstream payments use cases uh and this is why we're super excited about universal money address uma that we open sourced last november uh and uh which is basically enabling people to send and receive fiat or stable coins or ether or whatever you want on top of lightning um in a completely transparent and seamless way the same way that you know when you send an email you don't think about tcpip and smtp you don't think about bitcoin and lightning when you send a transaction on top of lightning using uma uh and so the way it works is you have a an address that is basically dar sign username at the domain and domain is actually your exchange your bank your wallet uh and then let's say that i'm denominated in dollars uh, and i'm sending money to christina in mexico uh, and she wants to receive Mexican pesos, I can do that in real time, 24-7, for a small fee, dollar to peso, and basically the net neutral settlement asset and uh, network that is transporting that value from the U.S. to Mexico in real time, cash final, is lightning using Bitcoin, which turns out has the best liquidity profile of any decentralized asset in the world. In this frontier moment, David is talking about how Bitcoin has the best liquidity profile for transactions. He's effectively describing how deep the global buy and sell side order book is for Bitcoin. To illustrate this, let's take a look at four of the largest exchanges and see how much a $100 million market sell order would move the price of Bitcoin. At the moment of recording, Bitcoin is trading at $67,750. A market sell order of 1,500 Bitcoins, which is over $100 million right now, would result in the price falling to only $67,580, a drop significantly less than 1%, only 25 bips for a massive immediate market sell order. This just shows how deep and liquid this market is, and it's open 24-7, 365. And now back to David. Uh, to actually do this very cheaply. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's something we're really excited about because we feel that the proliferation of domestic real-time payment systems everywhere, including in the US with RTP and FedNow, um, is going to require an interoperability uh, layer between them that is far better than correspondent banking in SWIFT that takes like days to clear, mm-hmm. doesn't work Friday after 5 p.m. It's super costly for most people, still requires you to physically walk into a branch and write a bunch of things on a piece of paper. Um, so that that's going to change. And we think that there's just nothing else that can perform that task of being the most neutral settlement asset between those real-time payment systems than Bitcoin. Yeah. So I guess, do you envision a future where people still kind of hold and trade dollars, but, you know, Bitcoin is kind of like the temporary, uh, you know, thing that's used to send the money back and forth? And like, you don't, so like the idea of like, you know, people want to hold Bitcoin rather than spend Bitcoin. Like, does that, like, does that concern you at all as far as like the, you know, use case of lightning? I think both can be true. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you know, it, TCP IP packets can be used for a wide variety of types of file types and content, right? It's like, it's like you need to transform something into 
zeros and ones, then move them on TCP IP packets over the network to get to the other side. And I see Bitcoin on top of Lightning as TCP IP packets for money. Um, and, and sometimes it'll be Bitcoin that will just you know, be the actual underlying assets that people want to receive or send. Mm -hmm. And we can make that maximally uh, uh, optimized fast and, and cheap. Uh, but sometimes people will want the currency that they need to use for buying services and goods that they need to buy every day. Uh, and we think that at least for the majority of the world uh, right now, that's what consumers would choose for day-to-day -day transactional uh, use cases. Uh, and it could be stable coins too. Stable coins are coming on Bitcoin and Lightning. Uh, I have mixed feelings about that, but they're coming. It's inevitable, so we're just going to embrace it. Uh, but... Uh, but it's um, it it'll work with stablecoins too. Are you concerned at all about stablecoins being on Lightning now? Or... So yeah, I think I think it's good because stablecoins really serve a purpose of optimizing transactions that are in the same currency to the same currency for a lot of people. Uh, in some cases, you have liquidity issues, but like I think in most cases, it'll make those transactions more efficient. Mm. Um, and I, my worry is more that you are moving from a system that's really fully decentralized, fully neutral, uh, with no centralized choke points, so to speak, within the network. And so I'd be very concerned if the entire Lightning network depended on one stable coin, for instance. Yeah. Uh, that would kind of make it like really tragic, frankly, to have like the most decentralized uh, asset in the world and network in the world now be re-centralized uh, but because everyone's using a stable coin. Uh, but I think what's going to happen in the next um, two years, two, three years, is that there's going to be so many stable coins. Everyone wants the stable coin these days. Yeah. And so you're going to have a fragmented liquidity of stable coins uh, that are going to be used for a variety of different purposes in different parts of the world uh, and on different platforms. And you're going to have to move that liquidity between the stable coins and net settle. And Bitcoin might be like, you know, the most highly liquid asset in between all of these pools of liquidity. So I think it might work out, uh, but I'm very schizophrenic about this in general. Fair. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, taking over the years, like, did you ever expect like something like Tether to be as big as it is today? Like I... I couldn't imagine it just being like this, you know, I guess on maybe like a hundred billion dollars or something close to that right now. It's pretty crazy to think of their yeah. rapid growth. I think if you travel to Africa, Latin America, and and you traveled back in the day when it started getting used, yeah. uh, you could see where it was headed because because people, you know, what people want is a US dollar denominated bank account. Most yeah. people in the world, that's what they want, right? And that's the closest thing yeah. that they could get to that because their home currency is not good. Yep. It's like, you know, tons of inflation and depreciation and I mean, the, the of um, devaluation. Uh, and so having a stable coin is actually the next best thing. And so if it's cheap to move it and I can buy it with, you know, I can take my, bad currency and get like an okay version of the dollar to, yeah. to my eyes if I'm in one of these countries uh, then it was pretty clear it was going to get really big really quick yeah I always thought it was funny that like Tether basically just holds like a bunch of you know 30 day uh -huh. T bills and it's kind of like are you Bitcoin like, yeah yeah and Bitcoin now too uh -huh. it's arguably like one of the safest banks in the world like they're not holding you know 30 year mortgages or whatnot they're just holding like treasury bills which are super safe in dollar terms so yeah crazy um, so, so interesting. Yeah. Um, do you think like the lightning network would benefit from goods or services that are only sold over like lightning network, like maybe like forbidden speech or pirated data? Like, is that a use case for, for lightning network? Well, I don't think that it is a use case for lightning network more than, you know, any other asset out there. Yeah. Um, uh, but I do think that native SATs denominated value exchange on Lightning is very valuable. So whether it's for content, um, whether it's going to be for AI agents to net settle value between them, which is going to become a real massive use case before we even know it. I think that's just like completely transform the way value moves around the world. And we don't fully realize this yet. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, what better 
unit of account of value than the most decentralized version of digital money in the world, right? If you make it massively efficient uh, and real time and cheap, then you know why would AI agents use anything else to net settle value? I mean, the the consumer facing version of that could be dollars and euros, etc. But like then you need to net settle the value that is being ex- exchanged between different AI agents. Um, I think Bitcoin is the prime candidate for that. Um, so, and and I also think that like you know, the 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 little piece of contents or gaming or things like this that the gaming use cases that could use Sats natively are also like really interesting to me. I think that you're you're, you're going to see more of that if it's like small amounts of Bitcoin that people can use to unlock content, unlock features, capabilities in the digital world. I think you know that's actually promising. How do you think about the future of AI agents? Like how disruptive do you, like AI, I feel like, like using ChatGPT the first time for me, I was like, this is, this is really cool. Like, uh-huh. how, how disruptive do you think it's going to actually be? Just in general? Yeah, just in general. I think mean, it's going to change the world. It's yeah. like, it's pretty clear, yeah. uh, but in really profound ways that we haven't seen in a long time. And so there, there are two ways to look at this. One is to be terrified. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and the other is to be super excited and, you know, trust, uh, trust humanity and, and, and ensuring that like, it'll be, it'll be okay. But I'm, I'm actually super excited. I think that the, 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 if we use it the right way, it'll give us humans superpowers, yeah. literally superpowers. And, uh, and you can see it come to life right now. And the pace of, uh, compounding innovation that's actually happening right now is crazy. Yeah. It's like, you know, the first version of chat GPT you used is probably a very different yeah. in terms of, of like a different version and different in capabilities than the one you're using right now uh, by a lot. And so I'm uh, I'm very excited. But I think for commerce applications and value exchange, it's pretty clear that you're going to have all kinds of different things taken care of by AI agents. Like, for instance, and I, I saw A16Z actually did this um, this thesis analysis that uh, AI agents um, are going to replace phone calls, uh, at least phone calls that we all have with companies and between mm-hmm. companies, et cetera. And I'm definitely here for that. Like, you know, I don't want to call another customer service yeah. 1-800 number ever again in my life. Like, it's like the worst. Uh, and so the ability for those agents to actually do that work on our behalf, for us to delegate that. And to delegate also transactional capabilities so they can actually purchase things on our behalf or exchange value on our behalf or receive payments on our behalf is going to be super critical. And, uh, and the UI for commerce is going to change in a profound way. Like today we have an app or a website and you know commerce in the age of automated conversational interfaces is going to be vastly different and require different things. So it's great. It's like when, when there's a paradigm shift in interfaces and compute, there's always massive opportunities. And the one thing that I know for sure is that money needs to move more efficiently to match the demand of these new cycles. Yeah. And we're here for that. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, it seems like there's going to be so much innovation and like increased efficiency. Like where do you think the wealth that's being created or like these, you know, increasing like technolo- technological advancements, like where does this end up going? Does it go to like AI companies? Does it like, Go into Bitcoin via like technology deflation. Like, how do you think about that? Nvidia. <laughs> yeah, Nvidia. That one's obvious. Today. You know. Yeah. Um, I mean, look. I think the question is, where is the most value going to be created? Uh, in the sense of, what are the biggest problems to be solved uh, in this new world for this to be, you know, maximally useful for everyone? Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, and, you know, we think that definitely money should move already. And by the way, this is an anomaly in the world. Everything that can be digitized has mostly been digitized and is moving on the internet natively, except for money. And yes, it's moving like in pockets, et cetera, but it's definitely not the mainstream way of moving money. Um, Swift and correspondent banking moves $5 trillion a day. And it's costly, not real time, et cetera. Like, it's crazy. It's, um, it's almost like you were telling me right now that there were more right now, that there were more faxes sent and received than emails and text messages exchanged. It would be nuts. And, but that's basically the reality of our payment systems and, and the way money moves today. And, um, and so 
for this world to evolve into this world of omnipresent AI agents that move bits and bytes 24-7 between them at the speed of light, literally, um, you need the same capability for value. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to be a big opportunity. Of course, we're not like, we're not like, you know, I'm not trying to hype up AI like everyone else because it's the cool thing that makes us look cool. I really believe that this is going to be really big. Uh, and it so happens that we're lucky enough that, you know, we've built capabilities that I think will become very useful in that world. Uh, that's definitely more luck than skill because I couldn't see how fast this AI wave was actually going to, how, how fast and how big it would be uh, when we started. Yeah, it, has, it definitely has been very fast and very cool to watch. Um, how does like LightSpark compare to like traditional payment companies like Visa or MasterCard? Like, do you think there's a future for for both or or is or yeah, like really. definitely okay definitely um like look first of all lightning and bitcoin are open networks that look a whole lot more like the internet uh and all of the other payment networks are centralized it's basically a centralized database that's you know moving you know from one cell to another uh value uh and we think open networks always end up winning it takes time uh and and but like if you look at the history of the world, uh, it always has trended towards open networks, mm -hmm. and we think the same will happen here. Uh, that's not to say that closed networks, when they're maximally optimized, like if you look at Visa, Mastercard, they're maximally optimized for the types of transactions they serve. That they can't also continue to serve their clients in a specific scenario, which is like for instance, in this case, like you know, in-store payments, really hard in developed nations to actually go and disrupt that. Um, there are ways, there are interesting avenues, but it's hard. Um, and so, and and I think, you know, most of those payments networks are trying to also be reinventing themselves yeah. and adapting to this new world and looking at those new networks and those new open networks as a way to grow themselves. Uh, but the bottom line is I think open networks always win. And I think Lightning and Bitcoin are open. Uh, any developer can come on the network and build. Uh, that's not the case of either the correspondent banking system. That's not the case of Visa. It's not the case of MasterCard. It's not the case of Swift. It's not the case of SEPA. It's not the case of FedNow. It's not the case of any of these payments network. They're all closed. Yeah. Uh, and you have to be a bank to participate. And here, like you can be, you know, a random dude in your garage and build uh, on top of Lightning and run your own node on a Raspberry Pi and do stuff. Uh, and I think that has immense value. Yeah, I agree. What what are the barriers to you know breaking down like the in person retail payments like is it possible and like when do you think it might be possible? I think it's really hard because there's such a um, such a stronghold of payment terminals yeah. that are closed payment terminals uh, and that uh, to their credit the the networks have made the experience better and better and better and more and more and more frictionless uh, to the point where. No one is complaining about how hard it is to pay in store. Uh, and, you know, when, when we had like uh, chip and pin come and people were complaining it was too slow <laughs> and Walmart was complaining that it was building lines because you had to put this thing, it had to read the chip, you had to type the pin. Then they came up with, you know, faster RFID based payments, which you tap and pay. And now like in big cities, it's the majority of transactions that are tap and pay, which is people are actually using their plastic, sometimes their phone, but sometimes yeah. just the plastic to tap and pay. It's so fast. Um, so those things are hard to disrupt. In this frontier moment, David is talking about how online payments are ripe for Bitcoin to disrupt. The global online payments industry is absolutely enormous. It was nearly a $7 trillion market in 2023, and Bitcoin and Lightning payments are still a small fraction of the overall market. Anders Helseth, a senior analyst at Arcane Research, has done some estimations on the growth of payments on the Bitcoin Lightning Network. His research suggested that the number of payments on the Lightning Network has roughly doubled compared to a year ago, while the value of the payments has increased by more than 400% measured in dollars. So it sounds like David might be right about the potential growth in the Lightning Network. And now back to David. Um, online payments, different story. Like that, that, there's just like no no friction there. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely use my Apple Pay like pretty much wherever I go. Yeah, it, it would be cool if I could somehow like pay, send some sats over, you know, 
an Apple Pay link. Yeah, like thing. it'll happen. I think that'll happen. And that's, by the way, that's exactly the way that those networks make themselves really helpful to the entire network is that you could have a Visa or MasterCard credential connected to your wallet that is Lightning enabled, that has a balance in Bitcoin, et cetera, and use that balance on the network to tap and pay. Um, that's how they make themselves super helpful and and continue to innovate on those networks. And they've been very forward coming with stable coins and other things yeah. as well. So that's what they're trying to do. So do you, you basically think, or do you think that they'll be forced to adopt like Lightning and, and Bitcoin eventually? It may just take some time. Yeah, I think that, you know, if you have hundreds of millions, if not billions of people on the network that want to use their balances, whether they're Bitcoin or not, like to actually access the other side of the payment network, that's a big opportunity for everyone. And I, I actually personally believe that the way that you reach mass markets with things like Lightning, mm -hmm. uh, but in this case, specifically Lightning, is to make it maximally compatible with all of the legacy payment rails and systems and networks. And the more you make it compatible, the more useful it's going to be to more people, the more you get the flywheel effect and the network effects of having more people on the network, the more value it accrues to everyone. Yeah. When it comes to like sending Bitcoin and, and using Bitcoin as payments, do you think like taxes, like just the accounting of that in, in the short term will always be like a major hurdle or do you think we'll somehow like get over that? If, if you're using Bitcoin to actually pay for something, yes. Mm. Uh, although... I'm pretty confident that the, the, the tax law will actually evolve. Yeah. Um, but in our case, what we're trying to do for retail payments is actually enable people to pay with fiat uh, on Bitcoin rails. And in this case, they're not touching Bitcoin technically. And at, as such, like they're just paying with dollars and they're just, they just happen to be using Bitcoin on Lightning as the rail. Um, and there's no tax problem there. Yeah. So will the, you know, like 3% visa fee or, or whatever, will that eventually just go away and, and go down to close to zero or? I mean, look, I think this is also super misunderstood. I think, okay. you know, visa basically, I think their take rate is basically 15, 14 basis points. Okay. And it's the banks on both sides of the network that are charging the lion's share of that interchange, huh. the issuer and the acquirer. Um, and so we'll see how that evolves. But, uh, but I think more interestingly, when you look at cross-border payments today, the effects fees that are charged, the fact that it's not real time, that it's very costly. Uh, I think a, an international wire transfer for the average US customer right now costs about 45 to $50. Yeah. Um, and can't, like, they can't do it over the weekend. They can't do it sure. after 5 p.m. Um, and it takes days. It's not real time. Uh, I think that's a huge opportunity. The, the the settlement of, uh, between domestic real-time payment systems. Uh, I think that's really ripe for disruption. Everyone wants a better solution. The world needs one. Uh, I think that's really the big opportunity in the short term. Yeah, that definitely makes a lot of sense to me. What's like the something that you believe that a lot of Bitcoiners probably disagree with? Well, I think that... It's kind of interesting. I have a lot of really good friends um, that are deep in Bitcoin uh, and that are way more dogmatic than I am. Uh, in the sense that, and you've met many of these people, uh, but in the sense that you have to use the thing in a certain way, uh, otherwise it's heretical like you know you have to self-custody you have to only use bitcoin uh you have to do things in a certain way uh otherwise you shall be banned on a remote uh, dark island for the rest of your life uh but i'm actually more pragmatic than that i think that you know for me the success of the network is as many people as possible using the technology uh i'm a product guy i'm a technology guy and i want you know, success for me is how many people are using the underlying technology and is it solving real world problems for billions of people? That's what I care about. And yes, we need to make compromises for that to happen because it's not like everyone will want to self custody. It's not like everyone will want to do things in a certain way in a way that it was invented. I'm glad that you have so many people who have thought of 
the protocol in such an adversarial way uh, and and as an escape valve for the system because we need that escape valve. It's vital. And if you didn't have these types of mindsets focused on that, we wouldn't have the winning network we have. At the same time, you have to make compromises to actually have mass market use it as well. Mm. And and I think that's probably my difference is that I'm a Bitcoin pragmatist. I'm not like super dogmatic. Yeah, probably a good way to be. Um, last question, then we can probably close it out. What do you think is the biggest risk to Bitcoin and then also just lightning? Well, there's so many risks. Yeah. Um, you know, it feels like almost like you know, from from the first day I got in Bitcoin, uh, uh, first of all, people were laughing about it and making fun of me for being obsessed. Yeah. Uh, and then they were like, okay, this thing is just going to die. Uh, and every year they came up with a new reason for why this thing is going to die. Uh, and it, you know, continued to survive despite all of uh, all of the attempts to kill this thing and 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 the force of gravity that most of these things tend to fail. Uh, and so I think there's something really special with Bitcoin. I think it's kind of, you know, the, the, the one thing that you cannot recreate. Uh, and there's been many attempts to recreate different versions and, 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 and do that, but there's only one Bitcoin and there will always be one Bitcoin. And I think like the, the, the way that this happened cannot be recreated. And as such, like having a maximally decentralized, trustless store of value, first of all, uh, that is completely decorrelated for, from most human interventions in the world right now is immensely valuable. And I think going to be continue, like will continue to be increasingly more valuable. And once we solve the mass market utility problems, it's, it's just going to become even more important for the world. Um, so there's going to be lots of risks. Um, but I think that this thing is just going to become stronger and stronger. And I think that, you know, way past our time here, it's going to still be around and be used in ways that we can't even imagine today. So, um, you know, yes, there is a risks, but I'm super bullish and optimistic long-term. Yeah, I definitely agree there. Well, David, this is awesome. Thanks for taking the time to sit down with us. Where can people go learn more about you and, and LightSpark? Uh, lightspark.com or you can find us on X and you can find me on X as well David Marcus and you know there everything's out there awesome love it well thanks again thank you